Good morning. Um, my name's Callie Tan. I'm a neonatologist at UCLH and um, I'm here to present the early neurodevelopmental um, outcome findings from the Urbana study. The Urbana study was my PhD study um, uh, based in Uganda and it looked at, it was a big case control study looking at perinatal risk factors for neonatal encephalopathy. This is Nadia, one of our um, wonderful uh, children, survivors of neonatal encephalopathy with cerebral palsy as a result of her newborn brain injury. Um, it's been estimated that 200 million children globally live with disability and more than a third of these with cerebral palsy. At the end of 2013, Joy Lorne, Hannah, Blenko and colleagues produced some really important global estimates of impairment um, after ne neonatal conditions. And that highlighted really the great disparities that occur in death and disability outcomes according to your income setting. Um, one of the things that we have been overwhelmed with the impact of amongst our Urbana cohort is the huge social, emotional and financial impacts amongst mothers and families caring for children with disability. And we have a poster downstairs looking at maternal experiences within the Urbana cohort. And this is taken from the series of papers in Nature Publishing led by Joy, um, just showing really the global burden of death and disability from intrapartum related neonatal encephalopathy, um, which is what we've been interested in in the Urbana study. So of 125 million babies born each year, more than a million will go on to have a newborn brain injury or neonatal encephalopathy. Of those, 400,000 will um, go on to have neurodevelopmental impairment cerebral palsy or some other long-term disability as a result of their newborn brain injury. So the Urbana study, um, the main aim of the Urbana study is to examine perinatal risk factors for and now long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes from neonatal encephalopathy amongst Ugandan newborns. Uh, and we're very proud to be, as far as I know, uh, the largest cohort of infants with neonatal encephalopathy to have ever been followed in sub-Saharan Africa. We recruited our babies from a very extraordinary hospital, I think, in Malago Hospital in Kampala, Uganda's capital. There is 100 babies born there per day. Um, Urban Myth says that there is more babies born there per square metre than anywhere in the world. Um, I don't know if that's true. Um, for you, those from the UK, this is, they, they deliver as many babies as we deliver in our Bristol network um, in a year. Um, we'd recruited 210 encephalopathic babies in just over a year um, and 409 control babies, normal term control babies as a, um, a comparison group. And we defined encephalopathy uh, according to a clinical scoring system that's been quite well established called the Thompson School, which has been validated in a South African population and used in cooling studies in the UK. And this is how the babies sort of came, followed through the course of the study. So they were recruited within 12 hours of birth and um, we did a lot of investigations and took a lot of information at the beginning, um, including placentas, blood, uh, obstetric history and perinatal intrapartum history. Um, we then saw them again at four weeks to look at their neonatal outcomes and uh, I'm presenting here today the findings of the 12 to 15 months follow-up and we're currently just coming to the end of seeing these children again actually at two and a half years. And at a year we performed neurodevelopmental um, uh, assessments using the Griffiths. Uh, the Griffiths mental developmental scales were validated in a South African population and we felt were um, relevant for assessment in our babies. Um, the babies were all assessed blind to case control status and all clinical uh, information. Uh, we did a neuro structured neurological examination and also uh, anthropometric measurements. And our loss to follow up rates really were very reasonable um, for a study that didn't ever have a community um, element to it. We have uh, just under 4% loss of our case cohort at a year and just under 20% loss amongst our control cohort. So how did we define poor uh, neurodevelopmental outcome? Well, when you do a Griffiths score, you get a developmental quotient, and a developmental quotient is a sort of like an IQ, um, but for development. Um, if you looked at the mean uh, DQ amongst one-year-olds in the UK, um, you would find it to be about between 100 and 105. 
Normal is defined quite um, uh, in a structured way as a DQ of greater than 85, mild as 70 to 85, moderate or severe impairment as less than 70, and DQ of less than 70. And we have added to that uh, any signs of profound hearing or visual loss. And to be um, considered to have profound hearing or visual loss, that means at one year we could elicit no responses on screening tests amongst these children. We did the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination, uh, which has been used in encephalopathy cohorts in the UK and has been found to be predictive of outcome. We looked at seizures, which I think are very important, and also malnutrition using weight for length Z scores um, amongst the cohorts. Just to sort of outline the cohort for you, um, the majority of our babies were moderately or severely encephalopathic at birth. I think it's very important to see this data because when you look at a lot of cohort studies, you'll see a lot of mild babies and really it's the moderate and severe we're most interested in because it's these babies that have the poor outcomes. Half of our babies in the um, encephalopathic uh, cohort um, had clinical seizures in the newborn period and a third of them died in the neonatal period with the heaviest burden of that in the first few days after birth. And when we followed them up at 12 to 15 months, we had 126 encephalopathic survivors and 330 of our control babies. So I've talked about the uh, neonatal case fatality rate of 30%. Um, which was obviously very significantly different to the control group. But we also went on to look at post-neonatal mortality. And there actually wasn't a significant difference between the case and the control group in post-neonatal mortality. Um, although, if you look at the numbers, twice as many babies died in the um, case group, in the encephalopathic group. But still, you can see that the burden of mortality is very heavily in the neonatal period, and particularly in the first few days. But overall, what this meant was, is that we had an infant mortality or infant case fatality of 37.3%. And what did we find when we looked at impairment? Well, what we found was that one in five of our encephalopathy survivors had significant impairment at a year. Um, and the majority of those babies were severely impaired. Uh, you can see from the pie chart, 18.3% of our babies had a severe impairment, 3.2% moderate, and then a group of 7% with mild impairments. But that 20% went up to 26% when we included any other indicators of an adverse outcome. So, for instance, on the Hammersmith Neurological Examination, if you score less than 60, that's been found to be predictive of a level of impairment, meaning that you will never ambulate or you will never walk. And, of course, walking is very, very important to families and children. Um, and that's always the thing that they will ask you, actually, will my child walk? So if we included that as an adverse indicator and we included seizures, then we found that a quarter of our babies had signs of at least one indicator of long-term sequelae. And we also looked at the type of cerebral palsy. And uh, you can see from the graph that the heaviest burden of cerebral palsy really falls into the spastic quadriplegic group. And that's quite um, common, uh, it's expected amongst encephalopathy babies because they, the type nature of their brain injury is a global brain injury uh, related to oxygen deprivation at the time of birth. We had a, a group, one in five, were dystonic, and we have this big unspecified group. The reason they're unspecified is because it's difficult at one year to always type um, the um, impairment that a child has, and we'll certainly be able to do that more thoroughly at the two and a half year follow up. We also looked at seizures, um, and I think there's a lot more work that could be done in seizures. Overall, amongst our neonatal encephalopathy survivors, one in ten had childhood seizures. Um, of those with significant impairment, that was 30%, and it's a major cause of morbidity and mortality in the encephalopathy survivors. And interestingly, more than 90% had seizures in the newborn period. Last time I was in Uganda, phenobarbitone, a very low cost, very effective drug for managing neonatal seizures, there was a national shortage. And that's frequently the situation. So I think there's more that we could be done to help these children early on with better management. 
Um, and what about those with neuro normal neurodevelopment? Well, interestingly, still 7% of those had had a seizure within their um, first year, after the neonatal period, but within the first year um, of life. And we looked at nutrition. Um, because one of the things that characterises our babies is their difficulties with feeding. And that's one of the ways that a lot of um, birth attendants identify babies with birth asphyxia, because they don't feed well. Um, and uh, sure enough, we found that a quarter of our encephalopathic babies had malnutrition um, at um, a year of age, compared to 5% if we looked at the unimpaired group in the cohort. And head circumference is very, very important. Um, it, microcephaly is very common amongst these children and it, uh, I think could be used as an indicator of poor outcome ultimately. 50% were microcephalic. Um, and actually what's interesting, if you look at the data, essentially if your head circumference at a year is less than 43 centimetres, your outcomes are poor. So overall, 50.5% uh, of half of our children had a poor outcome defined as death or significant impairment at a year. However, it's important to think about those that aren't impaired and didn't die. And the half of our cohort that survived, we compared them without impairment. We compared them to uh, our control group. And actually, their DQ scores weren't that different. Their DQ scores were 104 versus 106 in our control group. So they really scored rather well. And I think if you want to talk in a half glass full way about this data, I would like to say that half of our children had normal neurodevelopmental impairment, normal neurodevelopmental outcomes at a year. And so I feel that it's a strong theme for hope for, uh, um, for these children. So in conclusion, after neonatal encephalopathy, death and adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes at one year are common. Infants are young and definitive outcomes may be yet to be established in our group and um, I think these are conservative estimates actually of what we will ultimately see in the cohorts. Um, children were most effect, uh, frequently affected by spastic bilateral cerebral palsy, which really is the severest type of cerebral palsy. And as I said, with results of qualitative work, we found that stigma, social isolation, financial and emotional impacts of caring um, for a child with disability were high. But what does that mean for Nadia? What are we going to do to improve outcomes for children in the future? Well, I think what has been a really key message for us, and I'm really delighted to say we've just received some funding for, is to develop and pilot an early intervention programme for these children. And I think picking up some of the key themes from Joy and Richard's talks earlier, that early child development is absolutely key, this period of plasticity uh, it, between naught and two years. And we're hoping to really encapsulate that uh, and move forward with an early intervention programme. But in order to be able to identify children to be in the programme, we have to identify them early. And to identify them early, we need to find simple ways to identify children that are going to a high risk of being impaired. And that's another piece of work that we are working on at the moment. Head circumference being one of the things that we're thinking about, but also more complicated things like um, practical general movements, for those of you who are familiar with child neurology assessments. We talked about the quality gap, and there's going to be talk about the quality gap this afternoon, and that's absolutely key. Prevention is absolutely key for these babies, and closing the quality gap in maternity care uh, is ultimately important in preventing neonatal uh, encephalopathy. And finally, measuring. Measuring is so important, and we are not measuring these children currently. And we're working with Cerebral Palsy Alliance to see if we can develop a cerebral palsy register to help us facilitate identifying uh, and managing children with impairment. And that just leaves me one slide to say web to uh, all the supervisors, collaborators, and particularly the involved mothers and infants and team, study team. Thank you.